Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Looking Ahead to Metals and Miners, sponsored by Sprott. Today's webcast will provide one CFP, one SEMA, and one CFA CE credit. If you have questions on credit, please give us a call via the number on the console. We welcome and encourage your questions. You can type your question in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Materials, including today's presentation, have been made available for download from the document folder at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate your feedback. Please take a moment to take our brief survey that is also located at the bottom of your console. We will be covering quite a bit of information during today's webcast. If at any point in time you are interested in scheduling a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Sprott, please click the one-on-one -on -one folder at the bottom of your screen and confirm the request. And lastly, in the event you missed any part of today's webcast or simply would like to watch it again, a replay will be made available and all registrants will receive that information by email. And with that, I will turn the webcast over to Edward Coyne, Senior Managing Director, Global Sales at Sprott. Ed, please go ahead. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome everyone to our final webcast of 2022, Looking Ahead to Metals and Miners. I've asked four special guests to join us today to really talk about really the future of what uh, what our world is going to look like or potentially look like as we move forward into 2023. Um, with us today is Paul Wong, a CFA market strategist at Sprott Asset Management. Uh, Paul has more than 30 years of investment industry experience specializing in investment analysis for natural resource investments. Paul earned his Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Toronto and is a CFA charter holder. Also with us today is John Hathaway, CFA, Senior Portfolio Manager, Sprott Asset Management, and Managing Director at Sprott Inc. John Hathaway joined Sprott Asset Management in January of 2020 and is a Portfolio Manager of Sprott Hathaway Special Situation Strategy and Co-Portfolio Manager of the Sprott Gold Equity Fund. John earned his BA from Harvard College and an MBA from the University of Virginia and is a CFA charter holder. Also with us is Maria Smirnova, MBA, CFA, and Senior Portfolio Manager and Chief Investment Officer at Sprott Asset Management and Managing Director at Sprott Inc. Maria joined Sprott Asset Management LP as a Research Associate in May of 2005 and was appointed Associate Portfolio Manager in February of 2010. Portfolio Manager in 2014, and Senior Portfolio Manager in May of 2017. Maria graduated with distinction from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Commerce degree and received an MBA from the University of Toronto and is a CFA charter holder. And last but not least is John Champaglia. John is the Chief Executive Officer at Sprott Asset Management, Senior Managing Director at Sprott Inc. And John has more than 26 years of investment industry experience and serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Sprott Asset Management and as the Senior Managing Director of Sprott Inc. John earned his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from York University and is a CFA charter holder and a fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute. And once again, my name is Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Director at Sprott Asset Management, and I'll be your host today for our final webcast of 2022. Now, for those on the webcast today who aren't familiar with Sprott, uh, Sprott is a global leader in precious metals and real asset investment. With over $21 billion in assets under management, Sprott is one of the largest publicly traded companies, which trades on both the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol SII, focusing on precious metals and real assets. At Sprott, we offer unique solutions both in the physical market, the equity market, and the debt market. At Sprott, we allow our investors to directly allocate capital to physical gold, physical silver, a combination of gold and silver, as well as platinum, palladium, and uranium. We also have a unique suite of ETFs that range from our newly formed Sprott ESG physical gold ETF, as well as a uranium mining ETF, as well as two factor-based senior and junior mining ETFs, all in the precious metals and real estate market. Within our equity solutions, we also have our flagship U.S. gold equity mutual fund with the ticker symbol SGDLX, which is an actively managed multi-cap gold equity fund. And last but not least, we have a suite of private strategies with a primary focus on private lending to mid to small cap mining companies. 
So for today's webcast, we plan on looking ahead to metals and miners and exploring what 2023 and beyond may hold for us all as investors. Once again, I've asked Paul Wong to give us a macro and technical overview. I've asked John Hathaway to talk about gold and gold equities. I've asked Maria to talk about silver and the potential opportunities going forward. And last but not least, I've asked John Champaglia to join us to talk about uranium and energy transition minerals. Once our formal part of our webcast is concluded, I'll then turn it back to Melissa. At that point, she'll then turn it back to me to start opening up the webcast for some Q&A. Now, before we go into looking ahead, I would like to address just a few talking points of what we've had uh, happen so far in 2022. Um, as we know, uh, it's been quite a bit of a volatile market this year. Um, on a relative basis, however, gold bullion outperformed the broader U.S. equity and bond markets, with uranium being the notable strong performer. In fact, with some updated numbers through November 25th of 2022, uh, gold is now just down 4%, yet the S&P is still down 14.29%, and silver is down 6.71%. So albeit still a volatile year, we've seen a bit of a bright spot here in the last couple of weeks from a, from a trading standpoint. And with the U.S. dollar posting strong year-to-date run, we thought it would be interesting to look at how gold performed in local currencies through October 31st of 2022. And with the exception of the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar, gold actually posted positive returns in many of the key currencies, which is something I think that's worth noting giving the focus on currencies this year. So with 2022 returns approaching the rearview mirror, I'd like to now turn to Paul Wong for his views on the macro and technical trends. Uh, Paul, first and foremost, thank you for joining us on today's webcast. Thank you, Ed. Well, Paul, let's get started with what stood out in 2022 and what are you thinking uh, 2023 may provide us from an opportunity standpoint? Sure. Uh, what really stood out in 2022 was the, uh, the much higher in the expected inflation rates. Uh, to put in perspective, at the beginning of the year, uh, <clears throat> the, the curve was forecasting about 75 beeps rate increases for 2022. And here we are, we're almost 400 beeps in, into, the, into the rate rise. So the two year has now increased at the fastest clip in terms of basis points since the early 80s, over 40 years ago. And with that, it's taken the U.S. dollar higher as well <clears throat> through a function of rate differentials. And right now, the U.S. dollar on a year-over-year -year basis is about uh, about 20% uh, year-over-year change. So typically, since the Plaza Accord of uh, uh, 1985, about almost 40 years ago, a roughly 20% year-over-year change tends to mark the momentum peak in the U.S. dollar. Uh, next slide. So, but through it all, gold has actually uh, maintained a um, uh, a relatively stable trade band. Uh, there, are, there are you know very active, noisy spikes, which I think are are predominantly driven by you know CTA type flows or systematic flows. But looking at the 50-week moving average, it's actually traded in a very narrow band, <clears throat> about $60 over the uh, the past two years. On the panel below, I highlighted the, uh, the CFTC uh, non-commercial longs, the red line, and uh, I didn't mar overly mark it, but it's uh, sitting about roughly about a minus two standard deviation if you drew a regression ban on. So in terms of the longs, they're essentially at the very low end and washed out. And the shorts, uh, beginning of this month, uh, it was about 95 percentile in terms of you know, of, uh, of long of shorts. So. Long's gone and short's very high, producing a you know a very um, market um, basically prone for short covering, which is what we see in the last few weeks. Uh, so next slide. So the uh, essentially what we see now is the Fed has signaled that um, uh, you know the you know the, the pace of the rate hikes will slow, and that has you know led to momentum peaks in both yields and the U.S. dollar. And now we're seeing a short cover, in, you know, pretty much across the board and virtually almost all risk assets, and particularly for gold. So the downward pressure for most of 2022, higher dollar, higher yields, is now gone. Heading in 23, uh, what the market will start to reflect are the rate hikes of 2022, and 
given the pace of the rate hikes and the, you know the severity of moving the U.S. dollar simultaneously, I, I don't think the U.S. dollar and yields have lifted to this degree simultaneously in, in decades. And what will likely produce is there will be left tail events, um, <clears throat> kind of on, on the financial financial instability recession driven. And gold, I think, at that point, basically starts to you know retain its uh, safe haven uh, features. So for the most part, like I said, the uh, you know the upward the, the pressure from the higher U.S. dollar and higher rates is, is now over. Okay, so uh, long term, uh, on the lower panel on the left, uh, I broke out gold demand into, into two large, very large buckets. The green line is are basically uh, it's, uh, India, China, and central banks. Uh, the green line is a is a rolling 12 month uh, uh, gold purchase in metric tons. You can see that there's a wide gap between that and CFTC and ETS, which is represents investment demand. So overall, it's 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 outstripped uh, investment demand. So what we don't see is underneath the, underneath the waters is there's been very very strong buying, and in particular um, on the panel on the right is central bank buying. So central banks in the last quarter has now tripled its its uh, last average uh, quarterly buying rate. And that's probably likely due to the fact that uh, Russian reserves were, were frozen and seized uh, right after the Ukraine war. And the reason being is gold is outside money in, in that in the banking system, it, it, it's an asset without a corresponding liability. So with that, uh, we re rewritten in March that we expected central bank buying to increase. And so far, it does look like it's, it's, it, it appears to be playing out. <clears throat> and this is relatively important because this is a massive buyer. And the reason for buying gold is more strategic, and national security driven, and than than anything else. It's it's a it's a size buying that we're like it's it's just it's hard to uh, you know it's hard to uh, uh, get a handle on. But uh, right now, at at the current rate, um, it's about uh, 1,600 tons if you annualize it. And just for frame of reference, primary gold production is about 3,200 tons. So it's a significant amount of buying. And so into 23, we expect gold buying to resume on the investment side. But we think that uh, given the, the overall supply picture, I think we think that uh, there's going to be a very limited amount of gold available to for investment funds. Well, Paul, it certainly seems like the supply-demand matrix of, of gold going into the future looks pretty positive, particularly on that last chart there with central banks purchasing. So stick around, Paul, because we're going to open up the uh, the webcast for Q&A towards the end, and I know there will be some questions specifically on probably this last chart. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to now actually turn it over to John Hathaway to dig a bit into both gold and gold equity. Um, John, it's certainly a pleasure to have you on, and thank you for joining our webcast today. Thanks, Ed. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off with um, the subject that I think just won't go away, and that's dollar strength. And that certainly has been the major headwind for gold this year. Um, and I think the reason for that is the, the algorithmic robotic traders position uh, a strong dollar uh, by being long a uh, dollar or something uh, like the DXY, and then shorting gold. They short gold uh, without actually selling physical. They just uh, write uh, paper contracts uh, that exposes them to um, the short side of the gold price. And I think they intentionally have pushed it uh, lower in terms of uh, US dollar. But as we saw earlier in the webcast, uh, it was really only in the dollar that gold was Week uh, in other currencies, it actually held its own quite well. Um, my view is, and I think uh, it's shared throughout uh, the other speakers, is that the, um, the 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 strong dollar theme has probably crested, and, and sort of an infallible way of uh, seeing that is when you see magazine covers, and we have one here 
from Business Week, which is the strong dollar, but that's not the only one. There are several others. When, it, when, it, when, when a subject uh, makes uh, that kind of headline news, it's representative of a, uh, the bell ringing and an overcrowded trade. And frankly, since um, that, uh, that magazine cover um, that you're looking at right now, uh, the dollar has weakened quite a bit from its uh, peak reading of around 114 basis uh, DXY. So uh, uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, one reason that um, uh, the dollar has been strong has been uh, rising interest rates, the Fed's campaign to uh, stamp out inflation. And Time will tell whether they're successful in doing it. But one thing we can be sure of is that if they continue uh, moving interest rates higher, uh, they're going to wreck the U.S. economy and the global economy. Um, one way of seeing that is that uh, the rise in interest on uh, U.S. debt, um, if it's annualized, would, be, would add $300 billion to the U.S. deficit, um, which is already running uh, well over a trillion. Uh, so, so uh, in, in my mind, uh, I think you can argue uh, that um, further increases in interest rates would be very destabilizing. Um, and let me just sort of digress for a second and just say that while most, while many investors think of gold as an inflation um, hedge, um, it really uh, sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Uh, more importantly, gold is a strategic hedge against systemic risk. And looking at this chart, if it were to continue to rise, uh, I think you would see um, uh, systemic risk in the form of a sovereign credit bubble defaulting, um, which, would I, which would lead to uh, um, uh, maybe a credit collapse, maybe a deflationary credit collapse, uh, and possibly a lengthy recession uh, that would last much longer than uh, has, is generally um, uh, being uh, ac accepted by the investment co consensus. So um, I, I, I think bear in mind that the, the rise in the dollar is unsustainable. We've seen from a contrarian point of view reasons why uh, it's, it's probably a turning point. And then looking at this, just the, the math, the simple math on rising interest rates would be very destabilizing for the U.S. fiscal position. So let's move on to gold stocks in the next slide. Uh, let me just, just, uh, just comment briefly. Um, uh, Ed mentioned earlier that the S&P was down 14%. It's been down more than 20% and has bounced recently. But if you look at this, you, we're still in very overvalued territory. And um, should the Fed continue on its interest rate uh, hiking campaign, there's plenty of room for the stock market to, uh, to suffer further and, and quite possibly uh, decline more than 20% that, uh, that it did um, at its worst this year. So um, I would add uh, overvalued stock market to the category of systemic risk uh, and potentially a, uh, a um, reason why uh, the gold space uh, uh, could come back into favor. Now let's look at where um, gold stocks are on the next slide. Um, we can see that uh, valuations are at the low end of a very long um, time span here going back to 2006. So we've had a little bit of a bounce off the bottom, but um, when you look at um, this chart, uh, uh, gold stocks are cheap on a historical basis and also as a multiple of uh, enterprise value to EBITDA, um, they represent not only um, relative value, but also absolute value. Um, and we don't have this chart, but relative to the S&P 500, uh, gold stocks are actually uh, less expensive and by, um, by, by quite, quite a substantial amount. 
let's move to the last chart that I have here, and that is that um, gold stocks, uh, mining stocks are extremely inexpensive relative to a long time frame uh, to the bullion price. And any sort of regression um, back towards that 35-year um, average uh, would potentially give substantial returns um, uh, to gold stock investors. Why would this take place? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, a better, a better um, a trend change in the gold price, uh, which I think we've already started, and then secondly, um, the, the valuation that I talked about in the earlier chart, the relative valuation of gold stocks uh, to um, the average S&P stock is, is, is quite uh, undervalued. And um, so I think those two things alone would uh, argue for a regression of, and, and God forbid we have a resumption of the bull market trend in gold, which could take us uh, well north of uh, all-time highs of, in the 2200 area, um, I believe that uh, there would be uh, a, a scramble uh, for generalist investors to move into uh, gold mining stocks. So I'll end it there and look forward to your questions. Thank you, John. And many of our investors and many of our listeners on today's webcast do know Sprott as really the gold firm. Um, Yet we have substantial commitments to other metals, particularly silver. So with that in mind, I thought now would be an appropriate time to turn to Maria to talk really about all things silver. Uh, Maria, thank you also for joining us today on our webcast. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Ed. So turning to the first slide here, I just wanted to show you know, how versatile silver is and what makes this metal so special um, from different in, different industries and different uses. And I will highlight some of the uh, characteristics that silver has that, like I said, it makes the metal very different and special. So number one, it's highly light reflective, which me means it's ideal in uses like mirrors and, and you know, anything like that. It's a very electric, electrical conductive. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. And it has low electricity resistivity. And those two uh, make it very useful in electronics. And you can see here on this slide that it's used in almost all electronics. You know, and it's used in switches and, you know, circuit boards and connectors, et cetera. It's also used in photovoltaics and that's something I will talk about in a little while um, and it's used in vehicles etc so in other words these two properties are being again very electricity conductive and low resist resistant to uh, electricity current make it so versatile that it's used uh, in many many different uses and finally um, another important uh, function of silver is to kill bacteria. It's antimicrobial, which means it's used in, um, you know, in medicine. It's used in many very different things like band-aids. Uh, in hospitals, use it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we think that silver is quite a unique metal, um, and that's why I've been, we've been very passionate about it. Um, and going to the next slide. Here, um, I wanted to touch on two very important applications of silver. We have discussed these two before, but I wanted to highlight them again. Number one, and this is very well known, uh, silver is widely used in solar panels. And right now, estimates vary, but uh, about 100, 120 million ounces of silver, so about a tenth of the market goes into solar panels. And projection are, of course, you can see on the left chart is for this number to increase uh, very significantly going forward. And whether you think there will be thrifting, more thrifting or not, I mean, the, the chart is, you can see is just up and to the right. Um, and that, of course, has to do with the world um, going green and, you know, decarbonization themes. This will continue. Uh, governments do support 
solar um, installations, even in mining, you know, we speak to a lot of mining companies, part of their efforts are to implement solar fields. Um, and that just means it's good for silver. So that trend will continue. And I think it will intensify. And on the right side, um, I'm showing a graph that just shows penetration of electric vehicles versus ICE vehicles. ICE is internal combustion engine vehicles. So you can see the orange, green, and blue, dark blue lines. These are hybrids and battery electric vehicles. And of course, the more electric vehicles uh, we produce in the world, the more silver we'll use. And the reason for that, because these vehicles have, you know, more complex systems. They have more electrical and electronic systems. And again, this is a trend that we don't see reversing. Um, and, and loadings will continue to go up in the cars. So I'll give you some examples. You know, these are safety systems, entertainment systems, GPS systems, et cetera, et cetera. So anything where you have connectors, cameras, sensors, um, you will see greater use of silver. And of course, there's also associated infrastructure uh, with electric vehicles. There's charging stations. You have both charging stations that people install at home and in car parks, et cetera. So the use of silver will continue growing there. Uh, therefore, we think that silver use will also grow faster than vehicle production. And that's a very important point. So when someone says to me, well, you know, vehicle, you know, there's a recession and we're not going to sell as many cars. Well, maybe, but at the same time, we will sell more EVs. And again, I don't see that trend reversing. So let's now take a look at kind of the overall silver physical market. The Silver Institute, uh, in conjunction with Metals Focus, which is a research body, just released an update to their estimates for silver uh, supply and demand for 2022. And, and the numbers are very startling. So first of all, let's start with the supply. The supply is projected to grow 2% this year to about a billion and, a, and 17,000 ounces. Versus demand is actually expected to jump 16% to 1.2 billion ounces. And that is leading to a multi-decade high deficit of 194 million ounces. That, again, I will reiterate, that's a multi-decade high deficit. Um, you know, last year the deficit was about 48 million ounces, and the year before it was actually in surplus, according to the estimates. And, and that is very significant. And I will also say that, to me, the fact that supply is only projected to grow 2% is significant as well. You know, the, we haven't had a lot of new silver mine development, certainly not enough, as you can see, to offset the growing demand. And in fact, back in April, the projection was for mine supply to grow 2%, and now the mine supply is going to grow only 1%. Now, the other 1% is coming from scrap, of course. But again, that re reinstates the point that um, mining continues to underdeliver, and you know we're just not making enough of this stuff going forward. And on the supply demand, again, to see... 16% demand growth is very interesting to me. Um, as an aside, jewelry is expected to grow 29% and silverware 72%. Turning to the next slide, I take a look at a couple of, you know, more uh, drilling deeper into the demand side of things. We've seen a lot of strength in the silver market from India. As you can see on the top left chart, Silver imports uh, have skyrocketed this year. This is due both to restocking, but also to this rising demand. And the demand comes again from jewelry, from silverware, and from investing. Uh, coins and bars are, has sales have been strong in India this year. And so th that's not restocking. Um, on the right top, that is a chart again of overall bar and coin investment demand which is jumping 18% this year to 329 million ounces. Again, you can see the trend here. 
Uh, from about 2017, we've had growing year after year of growth in investment demand through bars and coins. This is being upset by uh, ETFs, but on the bars and coins, retail demand has been very, very strong. Um, and this, of course, is leading to a decline in global uh, stocks of silver. The top left, uh, the bottom left chart, sorry, is showing exactly that. Those two lines demonstrate the inventories both in London and in the COMEX. And you can see we've had about 400 million ounces worth of drawdowns this year. Again, that's a big, big number um, because we're, we're going off highs of, of um, stockpiles, but to lose 400 million ounces in stockpiles, that's 40% of the market that's left the building this year alone, and the year is not even over yet. So very interesting numbers this year. Um, I was certainly surprised by them, but it just reinforces the points that we have been making about silver and the underlying trends in this physical silver market. Now, if someone were to look at the price of silver, and the price of silver has declined this year from about $22 to $20, $21. So it actually sold off more and then has been recovering recently. But, you know, the price of silver has not responded this year to the the physical strength of the market. And the reason for that is that in the paper market, the investors um, have turned negative on silver. And again, it's to do with all the things we have discussed, the monetary tightening, the talk of rising interest rates. Um, you can see the positioning on the COMEX has been negative in silver the whole year. So that doesn't surprise me that it's affected the silver price negatively. And as well, as I already mentioned, ETF holdings have declined by 120 million ounces this year. Now, that still means the market is in deficit but just not as big of a deficit if you don't count the ETFs. So going forward, I think, you know, what happens next? Um, as John discussed, the dollar looks peaky. Um, you know, Paul discussed how central banks are buying gold. So that side of things ha has been strong. So I think for silver, you know, we're starting in a low place. Um, Sentiment is negative, washed out right now. At the same time, physical demand is strong. So any change to the positive in investor sentiment will just mean that the silver price can rocket. Um, and I, I, I truly believe that. People love silver, people, you know, and it's very useful in various industries. So again, you know, if we if we think that from here on in, uh, the Fed doesn't raise as fast, or the Fed pauses, or the Fed has to reverse course, at some point that will translate to strengthening gold and silver prices. And of course, silver can, um, you know, it, it declines faster than gold, but it also increases faster than gold. It's, it's more volatile than gold. So I think right now is a pretty good entry point for silver specifically. And like I said, I don't think there's a lot of downside. Well, thank you, Maria, and, and thank you for your comments. And, and like everyone else, all the guest speakers, you know, please stick around for the Q&A session, which will be coming up uh, post John and Paglio's comments. And with that, you know, many, you know, as you talked about, silver has many uh, modern uses in technology. And, you know, as SPRA continues to look for additional real asset opportunities uh, with metals such as uranium and energy minerals in general uh, becoming front page news, I thought it would be interesting to have John uh, Chipagli join us now and talk about really uranium and energy transition minerals in general and what that means, not just for SPRA, but what that means for potentially you as an investor and how to be thinking about that. Uh, John, thank you for joining us on the webcast today. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me, Ed, and, and thanks to everybody for making time out of your busy day. Um, I'm going to talk about energy transition, and you might be asking yourself, well, what does that mean, energy transition? What's this term all about, uh, and, and, and put it in very simple terms, it's really about shifting to lower, uh, less intensive uh, carbon forms of energy. This could be energy related to energy generation, uh, energy usage, and uh, lastly, uh, electric mobility, 
which is obviously a, a very large part of uh, our day-to-day -day lives. This energy transition that we see underway right now on a global basis, uh, we believe is going to be a, a very long-term secular trend that will play out over many decades. This is not going to be an overnight transition. Our existing energy infrastructure systems have largely been built over the last 125 odd years. So uh, as a result, you just cannot turn off something that has largely powered our, our lives and our economies for over a century and, and transition it to these new technologies and forms. But we do think the trend is underway and that the trend is obviously a little further ahead, I would say, in, in places outside of North America that aren't as energy rich in terms of natural resources. And, and I think that's been the catalyst for them to be more progressive. But I think the trend is, is starting to move around the world. And this transition uh, from an investment perspective is going to require significant capital spending for, for infrastructure, new technology and development. And it's really going to focus on three primary areas. And, and those are electricity generation, electricity transmission and energy storage. Um, and energy storage relates mostly to electric vehicles and large-scale large, large scale grid storage. So as I, as I said, this transition is going to be a long-term uh, trend, and it will be very intensive in terms of the amount of raw materials required for the transition. And on this slide, we've just highlighted a number of different minerals that we think are going to be very important for this, for this transition and the different stages here from going from energy generation to transmission to ultimate storage. So for example, Uranium in, in terms of nuclear energy is a key component. Silver is a key component for, for solar. Copper is obviously a, a very important uh, mineral for all things related to transmission, cabling, wiring, etc. And then when you get to energy storage, these are batteries. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries are very important and, and the key components there. Outside of lithium are, are minerals such as nickel, cobalt, manganese, graphite. Um, and so all of these things, we think, have very interesting long-term uh, stories behind them. Let's go to the next slide. So the world wants to decarbonize and uh, also move to lower forms of, of carbon emissions. At the same time, the world is, is in need of more and more electricity and more energy demand. Obviously, in North America, we have very... Uh, high standards of living, and all of us are accustomed to having very high levels of energy uh, in our lives. But the reality is, is there's there's hundreds of millions and billions of people around the world that we describe as being energy impoverished. And most of these people would love to have lifestyles like our own, and, and this is why we expect that over the next 20 odd years, elect electricity demand is expected to grow by 52 percent from 2020 levels. And so not only are we trying to figure out how to decarbonize our grid, but we're also trying to figure out how to do it uh, at the same time as, as requiring much higher levels of energy production. And that's the big challenge, um, but it's also the big opportunity that we see. Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about different forms of energy production. These are essentially all the ways you can generate electricity. You can have a nuclear power plant, you can have wind farms, solar, hydroelectric, biomass, which is essentially burning wood and other, and other things. You can have a natural gas-fired power plant and a coal-fired uh, power plant. There are very few oil uh, power plants left. Um, on this slide, what we show for the equivalent amount of energy, how much CO2 is produced. And you can see that you have forms uh, of energy production which are very low, like nuclear, wind, solar, and hydro. And then on the other side of the spectrum, coal is, is clearly the highest em emitting in terms of CO2. And the world is trying to move away from, from some of these forms of, of energy production in favor of lower. But the reality is, is coal is still the number one source of electricity production um, globally. And the reason why that is the case is because coal is very plentiful and coal is very cheap. And emerging markets and, and, and less well-off countries, such as China and India uh, and others, are, are still very dependent on coal. But there are also some other uh, Western countries um, that are dependent on coal, and they've been looking at diversifying and to, to more uh, lower greenhouse gas emitting forms of energy right now. 
But it's not just about CO2. It's also about reliability, and that's where I think nuclear power plays a really important role in this energy mix. So if you think about uh, how uh, reliable each of these different forms of energy are, nuclear is, actually, is the highest at 92%. So that means that 92% of the time, if you're running a nuclear power plant, it is generating electricity. In sharp contrast, if you look at, say, hydro, it, it, uh, hydroelectric, it's about 42% of the time. Wind is 35% of the time, and solar is, is the lowest at 25% of the time. So, yes, low greenhouse gas emissions are important, but equally important is their reliability and how, how often they are operating. So while we've added tremendous amount of re amounts of renewable energy to our grids around the world, uh, we have to make sure that we've got reliable backup baseload energy uh, production to dr address the intermittency related to weather-dependent forms of energy that I just outlined. Let's go to the next slide and talk a little, about, a little bit more about uh, where all the nuclear reactors are in the world today. So as you can see from this map, there are 434 uh, reactors in operation today. There's 60 more in, under construction and there are 96 more planned. I think it's fair to say that many countries in the West, including the United States, over the last 10 years or so, have really moved away from nuclear energy in terms of supporting it. And governments around the world through energy policy has been highly supportive of renewables. And as a result, we've spent trillions of dollars adding different forms of renewable power to the grid. The key challenge, is, as I just mentioned, is their intermittency. And so it's important to have backup uh, generation of, of different forms of, of power that can offset times when you know wind is not blowing or sun isn't shining. And, it really comes down to three choices. You can, you can burn coal, you can burn that gas, or you can have a nuclear power plant. And so as governments around the world are trying to achieve different net zero targets and commitments, and at the same time dealing with, with something we haven't had to think about for a very long time, which is energy security. Um, and energy security is really important for a country, uh, particularly if it is not energy rich. So if you think about the energy crisis that Europe is going through right now, as a result of the uh, invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia and what that's done to the different energy markets there, energy security has become very, very top of mind. And we think this is very similar to what happened in the 1970s when OPEC really squeezed the price of oil, and broke it out of its, out of its very long-term, I would say, sub-market sub um, pricing structure. And that was the catalyst that we saw in the 1970s that led to many of the nuclear power plants in the world being built uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, and that was a direct response to the oil crisis. We think there's a similar uh, there's a, a, a similar situation playing out right now. That as the price of natural gas and coal and oil have really spiked this year on the back of energy uh, energy security concerns, the governments are starting to reconsider how they look at nuclear power as part of their overall energy mix. And one thing that we've seen um, since the Biden administration has come into, into power is they have been incredibly supportive for nuclear energy, which is not very characteristic for most democratic uh, administrations. If we go around the globe, I think we've, we can identify numerous governments that have done energy U-turns, as we like to call them, in terms of uh, shifting policies back to help support nuclear energy, to help offset uh, some of these key issues around decarbonization energy security. For example, South Korea recently uh, had a new government come in place and they, they announced they would be not phasing out their nuclear energy, they would actually be expanding it. Um, Japan recently announced they would be restarting more of their nuclear uh, power plants. And in the United States, close to home, I think the most... Uh, Interesting case we were all watching was in the state of California, which uh, is trying to electrify everything and was scheduled to close its very last power plant down, nuclear power plant down in, in 2025, recently got a billion dollar funding commitment and uh, an, an operating life extension out to 2030. So there are a n number of these cases around the world where governments are doing these, these U-turns. Let's go to the, the next uh, slide. 
So with all this happening, uh, with all the build-outs going on and all of the life extensions for existing power plants, this is obviously providing a huge boost to the sector. And on this slide, what we're showing you here is the uranium sector in two forms. One is the physical commodity itself. Uh, that's the uranium spot price. And you can see that uh, you know, over the last couple of years, it has is, it is broken out of a, of a long kind of range-bound uh, uh, price experience. And the blue line is the, is the North Shore Global Uranium Mining Index, which is an index uh, that comprises about 35 uh, different companies related to uranium mining. You can see that the uranium stocks are much more volatile, as you would expect, um, and they've been very volatile um, in the last year or so. But generally, when the price of the commodity is going up, the uranium stocks, because of their operating leverage and optionality, they can produce uh, greater returns. And we've probably talked to, oh, a couple of hundred different institutions in the last year around the world and family offices that are interested in this uranium thesis because they just see all the pieces of the puzzle come together after a very long uh, period of, of poor returns in the sector. And capital is starting to come back into the sector, and we think that the sector is still in the very early stages of its recovery. The reason we say that is because if you look at the supply-demand fundamentals for uranium, which is the fuel that powers nuclear reactors, it's still very much out of whack. And if we go to the next slide, I borrowed this work from a uranium analyst at Cantor Fitzgerald named Mike Kozak, who's based in Toronto. This is his, uh, uh, this is his uranium production and demand uh, supply model over the next 20-odd uh, years. And what he does is breaks down all of the uranium supply coming to market from primary mine supplies, those are producing mines, uh, new mines under development, restarted uh, idle capacity that's been, that was closed uh, and put on care and maintenance. And he, he's also got new mines that are in the works, so mines that are going to be uh, constructed in, in the next 10 years or so. And you can see that that top line are the reactor requirements in pounds per annum. So right now, the 434-odd reactors I mentioned, they require about 180 million pounds of uranium each and every year for their fuel stock. Primary production is about 130 million pounds right now, and, and next year probably going to 140, 145 pounds, million pounds. This supply deficit in our in our minds, can only be really solved by, by one way, and that is uh, more mines need to come online. And unfortunately, with the cost of everything going up, uh, there are much higher incentive prices required to build a new mine today than there were a few years ago. So the price of uranium today is around 50 odd dollars a pound. That's up from around 28 dollars a pound about 16 months ago. So the price is starting to move for sure. But the reality is that's enough of a, of a price point to incent a company to restart an existing mine that's been on care and maintenance. But it's a, far, it's a far distance in terms of a price that you would need to actually build a new mine. And we see this um, across many capital intensive industries. The costs have gone up significantly. We think the, the cost or the price that you would need to see uh, in uranium to incent development of any new greenfield uh, project is somewhere between $75 and $100 per pound. And I think that that belief is what has attracted a lot of capital back to the sector after a very long hiatus. And I think that's that provides a very interesting investment opportunity to, uh, to, to consider. And with that, I'll pass it back to Ed. Thank you, John, and, and thank everyone uh, on this group uh, webcast for participating. Uh, before we go into the Q&A session, I'd like to turn it back to Melissa to read off a few comments, and then we'll open up the webcast for several questions. We're currently at 45 questions, so at best we'll probably get to six to eight questions today, but rest assured we'll be reaching out to everyone else via email and or phone call to address everyone's questions on an individual basis. Uh, so Melissa, I'll turn it back to you. 
Great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, as a reminder, materials can be found in the document folder at the bottom of your screen. We appreciate your feedback. Please take a moment to fill out our brief survey, also located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as Ed mentioned, we will be taking advisor questions. Please type your question in the box to the right of your slides of the slides. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as possible. Uh, and as he mentioned, in the event the question is not answered, Sprott will follow up after the live event. Um, uh, and if you would like to have a conversation to further discuss the ideas that were covered during today's event, please click the one-on-one -on -one folder at the bottom of your screen and confirm the request. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ed. Thank you, Melissa. And, you know, I've been going through the questions um, as all of our speakers have been talking, and this seems to be an overarching question as it relates to uh, the win. It seems like most listeners agree that the story is sound for really gold, silver, and, and energy transition metals across the board. But John uh, Hathaway, I think this first question uh, is best served for you. And the question is, you know, what effect would you expect a continued strong dollar to have on both gold and gold miners versus a softening or weak dollar? Well, from what we've seen this last year, uh, the strong dollar <clears throat> has been a real headwind, and uh, I don't think it's going to happen. But if the dollar uh, were to strengthen further, um, that probably um, would would not be good for gold until it destabilizes the system, which is, I think, what would be, be the end game. Um, a weaker dollar, again, we're talking weak relative to other currencies that are also inherently flawed, fiat currencies that are just basically the issuance of sovereigns without anything backing it up except promises. Um, so a weaker dollar <clears throat> against the euro, the yen, and so forth um, would would be helpful, positive. Um, but I think the bigger picture is that uh, no, uh, gold will uh, gold has risen over uh, 20 years against all currencies. And that has been through thick and thin with strong dollar, weak dollar. So even though the strong dollar, weak dollar argument has been at the top of everyone's uh, uh, list of questions in the last year or so, I think over the longer run, uh, it doesn't have that much effect. So long-winded answer to a uh, question. But strong dollar, if it continues, if it were to re resume, that would probably be not helpful. A weaker dollar, again, this is just relative stuff, would be would be positive. Thank you, John. And so another question that came in uh, relates to the underlying miners themselves. And I think it doesn't say specifically, but I believe this is referring to both gold and silver miners in general. Um, Maria, why don't, why don't you tackle this question? Uh, the question is, what is your outlook for the junior miners versus the larger, more established senior miners? So that's actually a very good question, Ed. Um, you know, our specialty is mostly uh, smaller to mid-cap miners. But I would say that in a down market, the larger cap uh, tend to perform better. And so we've seen that outperformance recently. Now, when there's a turn, uh, the large cap miners continue to outperform for a bit. And the reason for that is as money starts going into the sector, you know, generalists start deploying cash, that money first goes to the majors. Why? Because these are the big producers. It's easier to deploy money in bigger amounts, et cetera, et cetera. But there comes a point, and usually, you know, it's a few months into a rally that um, it flows into the juniors. And then the juniors really start outperforming. And the reason for that is the junior – sector is just by definition smaller so you know it doesn't take very much of funds to move the stock prices uh, pretty significantly so i think you know going forward i would expect uh, a continuation of, of performance by the larger caps for now uh, with eventually you know translating to a bigger rally in the juniors Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and, Paul, I'm going to shift to you for a second on this question. This talks specifically about, I guess, the economy or probably more specifically the equity market, meaning, um, you know, derivatives of the market, options, and so forth. The question is this. It says, 
Does the paper gold market have a limit? And if so, what is that limit? And what would that mean for the physical market going forward? Um, I think I've read that right. So what, what's your take on the, on the paper market effectively? Um, is there a limit to that, Paul? I guess not really. It depends on whether who is willing to underwrite uh, the paper market. So uh, that's probably your, your bottleneck there. Uh, that's never been tested, I don't think. Um, but just from the physical market itself, you know, we, we still we see really strong demand from the physical market. And the reason why golds have not collapsed under this, you know, incredible pressure of higher rates and higher U.S. dollar simultaneous is, is that strong underlying physical demand. And expect to see that probably continue, you know, as, you know, not, not to... Basically, the whole planet, the whole world is going through a process of deglobalization. We are breaking into economic blocks. But economic blocks will still need to trade with one another, and they will still need to interact within a global financial banking system. And again, that's that's the attraction of gold as outside money. You will need outside money if you still intend to operate within the global system. And that's it's very different from what we've seen um, over the last 30 years, but it seems that we are definitely heading towards that that process. Yeah, it seems the number one question is when, right? That, as I read through all these questions, the constant one is, when is this going to move? When is it going to happen? It's been, it's been kind of languishing for a while, and I think we got a lot of believers that just think that the timing is, is going to have to be, uh, be right, I suppose. Um, John Chapago, let's shift to you. So the question is, um, thank you for your comments on uranium. Can you touch on other metals like copper, aluminum, and nickel? Um, any, any comments there, John? Yeah, sure. So we, we think uh, all of those metals are going to see big increases in demand, specifically from energy transition uh, related reasons. So if you think about, you know, the amount of copper, let's say, in an electric car or uh, build out of electricity production and the related transmission lines, cabling, all that stuff, that's obviously going to have huge impact on on things uh, like copper, nickel is, is going to be a big beneficiary uh, due to its use in nickel-based uh, battery chemistry. So these are the the dominant uh, battery chemistries for for most cars that uh, you and I would buy, electric cars that you and I would buy. Um, and the 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 thing that's also colliding here is is not just the increased demand, but we, we're coming out of a period for most of the last 10 years where the world has been really fixated on technology uh, and has largely ignored all things related to mining. And as a result of that, you know, the sector was largely starved of capital and there's been very little investment in the sector. So we think you're going to have a situation where the world will want more of these critical raw materials and at the same time, the lead time to develop new mines, in many cases, can be 10 to 15 years. So we've got this kind of mismatch of timing. And that mismatch of timing, I think, can put a significant uh, pressure on the prices of these commodities. We've seen it uh, in a number of cases where, whether it was the price of cobalt or lithium or uranium, all of these things can move very quickly in a short period of time because we haven't built a lot of capacity over the last 10 years. And I, and I think that will make the sectors more volatile, but I also think that makes the sectors very interesting from an investment perspective. Thank you, John. And, and we're, we're at 51 questions and coming up on the hour. So I'll ask one last question here, and, and I think this one will go back to um, John Hathaway. Uh, and this is, this is what I think that people are all interested in, which is the timing. And, and, and maybe, you know, Paul or Maria might want to add this as well, but the question is this, the narrative for, for metals remains strong, yet prices are not moving as expected. What key or keys should I be looking for for that price appreciation to happen? It's sort of a lot of question in that in that sentence. But, right, um, and, uh, and I'll just try to give a real quick answer so the others can uh, also contribute. I would say uh, in, the, in the very short run, uh, recognition that the Fed has run out of gas, that their playbook is uh, 
no longer working and um uh, uh that that uh that we are um uh, facing a uh, 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 uh a situation where uh, monetary expansion um, and easing isn't going to go, isn't going to uh, stimulate the economy. So I would say, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I think we're we're getting there, and I think maybe sometime in the next year uh, that will become clear. So uh, I'll let the others also contribute. Thank you, John and, and Maria. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree with John, but I also think, uh, you know, first we need a recognition that um, the economies are becoming, you know, going into trouble faster than people think, right? And and that's the first recognition. Um, so we first need a, a turnaround in, in the policies. And then further to John's, like, yeah, the next step is a recognition that even if we have liquidity injections again, that's not enough because we haven't fundamentally changed our policies, you know, or at least not enough. The fiscal side of things has to change too. And lastly, uh, Paul, from a pure technical standpoint, any additional color you'd want to add to that final question? I, I would look for um, investment return investment uh, buying demand uh, through CFTC longs and ETF buying. Right now, they've they've run down almost uh, roughly about uh, 35 million ounces, uh, you know, rough equivalent from the you know from the peak in March, and when that reverses, I'd be very curious to see the price reaction relative to you know how much gold has been literally taken out through the physical market. So I, I think there's a, a, a buy, uh, basically another squeeze the other way happening. We squeezed on the downside. I think there's probably in, into early 23 a squeeze to the upside. When we start hitting financial instability issues. Well, thank you, Paul. And, and there's a lot of questions here as it relates to product and so forth. We're not here to, to you know, pitch product per se, but I encourage you, uh, based on where you're, you're located, uh, to reach out to our senior investment consultants, whether you're, whether you're on the West Coast, the Central Region, or the Eastern Region. And from a product standpoint, um, the sticker symbols that are just put up on the slide can give you some guidance, but we will be following up with each one of you individually uh, based off the questions we've received. Um, we will be doing some additional follow-up. There will be a replay available, um, and there'll be also downloads available. So once again, thank you all for joining us on today's webcast. Um, enjoy the holiday season, and we'll be looking forward to speaking with you all in the coming year. Well, thanks again, Ed, and uh, thank you all for such an informative discussion. We appreciate your feedback. Please take a moment to fill out our brief survey, also located at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to have a conversation to further discuss the ideas that were covered during today's event, please click the one-on-one -on -one folder at the bottom of the screen and confirm that request. And thanks again, and I hope you all enjoy the remainder of your day.